Okay, so we are just getting ready to end the great piece. Okay. <clears throat> Harry, who was starting to feel warm and sleepy, looked up at the high table again. Hagrid was drinking deeply from his goblet. Professor McGonagall was talking to Professor Dumbledore. Dumbledore. Professor Quirrell, in his absurd turban, was talking to a teacher with greasy black hair, a hooked nose, and sallow skin. It happened very suddenly. The hooked nosed teacher looked past Quirrell's turban straight into Harry's eyes. And a sharp, hot pain shot across the scar on Harry's forehead. Ouch! Harry clapped a hand to his head. What is it? asked Percy. Nothing. The pain had gone as quickly as it had come. Harder to shake off was the feeling Harry got from the teacher's look, a feeling he didn't like, that he didn't like Harry at all. Who's that teacher talking to Professor Quirrell? asked Piercy. He asked Piercy. Oh, you know Quirrell already, do you? No wonder he's looking so nervous. That's Professor Snape. He teaches potions, but he doesn't want to. Everyone knows he's after Quirrell's job. Knows an awful lot about the dark arts, Snape. Harry watched Snape for a while, but Snape didn't look at him again. At last, the puddings too disappeared and Professor Dumbledore got to his feet again. The hall fell silent. <clears throat> Just a few more words now as we are all fed and watered. I have a few start of term notices to give you. First year should note that the forest in the grounds is forbidden to all pupils and a few of our older students would do well to remember that as well. Dumbledore's twinkling eyes flashed in the direction of the Weasley twins. I have also been asked by Mr. Filch, the caretaker, to remind you all that no magic should be done, should be used between classes in the corridors. Quidditch trials will be held in the second week of term. Anyone interested in playing for their house teams should contact Madame Hooch. And finally, I must tell you that this year, the third floor corridor on the right hand side is out of bounds to everyone who does not wish to die a very painful death. Harry laughed, but he was one of the few that did. He's not serious, he muttered to Piercy. Must be, said Piercy, frowning at Dumbledore. It's odd because he usually gives us a reason why we're not allowed to go somewhere. The forest is full of dangers, of dangerous beasts. Everyone knows that. I do think he might have told us prefix at least. And now, before we go to bed, let us sing the school song, cried Dumbledore. Harry noticed the other teacher's smiles had become rather fixed. Dumbledore gave his wand a little flick as if he were trying to get a fly off the end, and a long gold ribbon flew out of it, which rose high above the tables and twisted itself snake-like into words. Everyone pick their favorite tune, said Dumbledore, and off we go. And the school bellowed, Hogwarts, Hogwarts, Hoggy Wardy, Hogwarts, teach us something, please, whether we be old and bald or young with scabby knees. Our heads could do with filling with some interesting stuff, for now they're bare and full of air, dead flies and bits of fluff. So teach us something, things worth knowing, bring us back what we forgot. Just do your best, we'll do the rest, and learn until our brains all rot. Oh, what a nice song. Everybody finished the song at different times. At last, only the Weasley twins were left singing along in a very slow funeral march. Dumbledore conducted their last few lines with his wand, and when they had finished, he was one of those who clapped the loudest. Ah, music, he said, wiping his eyes. A magic beyond all we do here. And now, bedtime. Off you trot. The Gryffindor first years followed Piercy through the chattering crowd out of the great hall and up the marble staircase. Harry's legs were like lead again, but only because he was so tired and full of food. He was too sleepy even to be surprised that the people in the portraits along the corridors whispered and pointed as they passed, or that twice Piercy led them through doorways hidden behind sliding panels and hanging tapestries. A tapestry is like um, a long like picture kind of, but made out of material. They climbed more staircases, yawning and dragging their feet, and Harry was just wondering how much further they had to go when they came to a sudden halt. A bundle of walking sticks was floating in mid-air ahead of them, and as Piercy took a step toward them, they started throwing themselves at him. Peeves, Pe 
Piercy whispered to the first years, a poltergeist. He raised his voice, Peeves, show yourself. A loud, rude sound, like the air being let out of a balloon, answered. Do you want me to go to the Bloody Baron? There was a pop, and a little man with wicked, dark eyes and a wide mouth appeared, floating cross-legged in the air, clutching the walking stick. Ooh, he said with an evil cackle, Ickle firsties, what fun. He swooped suddenly at them. They all ducked. Go away, Peeves, or I'll, or the Baron will hear about this. I mean it, barked Percy. Peeves stuck out his tongue and vanished, dropping the walking sticks on Neville's head. They heard the zooming away, rattling the coats of armor as he passed. You want to watch out for Peeves, said Percy, as they set off again. The bloody baron's the only one who can control him. He won't even listen to us prefix. Here we are. At the very end of the corridor hung a portrait of a, as a, of a very fat woman in a pink silk dress. Password, she said. Caput Draconius, said Piercy, and the portrait swung forward to reveal a round hole in the wall. They all scrambled through it. Neville needed a leg up and found themselves in the Gryffindor common room a cozy, round room full of squishy armchairs. Piercy directed the girls through one of the doors in the dormitory and the boys through another. At the top of the spiral staircase, they were obviously in one of the towers. They found their beds at last. Five, four posters hung with deep red velvet curtains. Their trunks had already been brought up. Too tired to talk much, they pulled on their pajamas and fell into bed. Great food, isn't it? Ron muttered to Harry through the hangings. Get off, Scabbers. He's chewing my sheets. Harry was going to ask Ron if he'd had any of the truckle tart, but he fell asleep almost at once. Perhaps Harry had eaten a bit too much because he had a very strange dream. He was wearing Professor Quirrell's turban, which kept talking to him, telling him he must transfer to Slytherin at once because it was his destiny. Harry told the turban he didn't want to be in Slytherin. It got heavier and heavier. He tried to pull it off but it tightened painfully, and there was Malfoy laughing at him as he struggled. Then Malfoy turned into the hook-nosed teacher, Snape, whose laugh became high and cold. There was a burst of green light, and Harry woke, sweating and shaking. He rolled over and fell asleep again, and when he woke the next day, he didn't remember the dream at all. Okay, that's the end of chapter seven.